Help give kids an extra life by donating today to help sick and injured children. Link in the description and pinned comment below. Okay, if this video came out later than you're used to, it's probably because I was out sick for a few days. Merry Sickmas, everybody. Hashire sori yo, kaze no yoo ni, tsuki mihara wo, padoru padoru. Okay, let's do some unpacking here. We've got the Zelda Game & Watch, the Metroid Dread, the Nendoroid Pokemon game, and... Ryota! Oh, it's this game's anniversary this year, huh? Well, how about that? So, who here loves co-op? Well, I certainly do. From games like Monster Hunter to Castle Crashers, games are just more fun when you can share them with your friends. And arcade games are no different. Co-op games date back as far as 1973 with Atari's Pong Doubles, and games like Gauntlet popularized co-op with as many as four players. I've not seen such bravery. However, when it comes to arcade co-op, one of the first games that comes to mind for me is Taito's co-op classic, Bubble Bobble. Now, Taito is one of the great pioneers of gaming alongside giants such as Namco, Sega, and SNK, and while they're not as prominent now as they were in the past, especially now that they're owned by Square Enix, they're every bit a part of the retro revival movement as said companies. And they're part of the reason that arcades are still a big thing in Japan. And Bubble Bobble is one of the big reasons why. So today, we're going to look at the original, as well as a few sequels, and look at why this adorable classic stands the test of time as an arcade legend. I mean, there's a reason that Bubs become a de facto spokes dragon for these guys. The story of Bubble Bobble's development began with Fukio Mitsuji, a game designer at Taito. Mitsuji was a fan of Namco's games at the time, especially Xevious. By comparison, he found Taito's early works to be rather unimpressive. To be fair, he kinda had a point. Apart from Space Invaders and maybe Kicks, how many of Taito's games pre-1985 do you actually know? So Mitsuji was determined to help Taito push out higher quality games. His first two games were Super Dead Heat and Halley's Comet, both released in 1985. After which, Mitsuji sought to create a platformer as his next game, with a cuter and more lighthearted aesthetic than his previous work. More specifically, he wanted to create a game that could appeal to women. After narrowing down a list of over a hundred ideas, he ultimately settled on Bubbles, and later changed the player characters from the initial idea of robots to the Bubble Dragons we know today. Moreover, he wanted the games to be played by couples, which is the reason the game was made co-op, not to mention the reasoning behind several of the game's design decisions. In trying to make the game better before release, Mitsuji worked himself half to death, working late nights and even holidays looking for ways to improve it. Workaholic culture is crazy, I swear. Bubble Bobble was eventually released in June of 1986 in Japan, with a worldwide release in October that year, distributed by Romstar in the US and Electric Coin Automatics in Europe. The game enjoyed great critical and commercial success, and I'm here to talk about what made it so special. So let's pop a quarter in the slot and start this baby up! So the story goes that Bub and Bob were turned into bubble dragons by an evil sorcerer, who kidnapped their sweethearts and locked them away in the Cave of Monsters. And now the dragons must venture through the cave's 100 floors to defeat the sorcerer and save their loved ones. Sounds simple, right? Yeah, no, it's an arcade game. It's challenging. The idea is simple enough, though. Every floor takes place on a single screen, and you can jump and blow bubbles. The bubbles are used for trapping enemies, after which you can pop them with your fins or body weight to defeat the baddies inside. You earn bonus points by defeating multiple enemies at once, and they leave behind bonus items when defeated. You can also hold the jump button to bounce off of bubbles and ride each level's specific wind currents to get to out-of-reach platforms. Each level ends when all the enemies are beaten, after which you have a few seconds to pick up any remaining items before being whisked off to the next stage. What makes the game challenging is the level design and enemies. Enemies come in all sorts, from enemies that simply walk, fly, or bounce around the room, to enemies that fire rocks, fireballs, or even lasers. There are even callbacks to past Taito games. One of the enemies comes straight from Space Invaders, and a couple of other enemies come from a game called Chack and Pop that Taito released a few years earlier. Also, be sure not to loiter in a level, because loitering in the Cave of Monsters will have you dealing with this game's equivalent to a security guard. This 
is Baron Von Blubba. He shows up if you take too long, is completely invincible, and will pursue you until you either complete the level or get killed. This guy scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. My childhood was embarrassing. Of course, the game doesn't exactly leave you helpless. Far from it, in fact. First off, aside from the obligatory points for lives, the game meets out a wide assortment of items, from enhancements to your speed and bubbles, to screen clearing items, to pickups that let you skip levels, and more. There are also elemental bubbles which can defeat enemies with lightning, water, and fire. They can affect you, but they can't kill you. What this game also did was reward expert play in a few ways, in fact. Defeating multiple enemies could make a lettered bubble appear, and collecting all the letters of the word extend gave you an extra life. And especially good players who reached certain levels without dying could enter a secret door. Now where's that one clip from Foster's when you need it, huh? And all these rooms have secret codes that give hints as to how to get the good ending. This was one of the first games to include multiple endings depending on how you play. See, at the bottom floor is the game's boss, Grumple Gromit. Or as he's called in Japan, Super Drunk. To beat him, you need to grab the potion that lets you blow lightning bubbles. By the way... Yes, that is Flight of the Bumblebee, the composers weren't even trying to deny it. So once you beat the boss, you've won, right? Yeah, no. If you go out alone, you get a message telling you to come back with a friend. The game wasn't just designed for couples to play, it was meant for couples to complete. To get the good ending, you just need to have both players on screen when the boss is beaten. Then you return to normal, save your sweeties, and roll credits. And then get a code for the super mode, which changes the enemies around and is overall more challenging. Beat that with two players to get the true ending, in which it's revealed that their parents were caught up in all this, too. Keys, that last twist is surprisingly dark. Bubble Wobble was a huge success for Taito, and is still hailed as one of the greatest classic games of all time for its character design, memorable theme tune, and addictive co-op gameplay, which still holds up to this day and would inspire many more games of the type. It was also ported to numerous platforms, most notably the NES and the lesser-known Sega Master System version, and had several sequels. Let's take a look at some of them. The first of these is Rainbow Islands, the story of Bubble Bobble 2. Released in 1987, at a time when sequels being noticeably different from their predecessors wasn't exactly uncommon. This game is a vertically oriented platformer, featuring Bubby and Bobby in their human forms as they journey across the various islands to drive away the monsters that have infested them. You attack by shooting rainbows, and destroy enemies either directly or by crushing them under fallen rainbows. You can actually walk along the rainbows or bounce on them by holding jump in order to help you get higher. There are initially seven worlds, each with four levels. Each world has its own visual theme and its own set of enemies. There's even a world based on Arkanoid, another Taito classic. You clear each level by reaching the goal at the top, and each world is capped off by a boss which you defeat by depleting its health bar with rainbows. By the way, the level theme is... Um, Taito, MGM called, they want their royalties. Like the original, there are plenty of items that help you, and like Bubble Bobble, you gotta put in some extra work to reach the true ending. Normally at the end of World 7, you reach a fake ending, where it's revealed that the so-called Boss of Shadow captured the people of the islands and turned them into Bubble Dragons. In order to reach him, first you must get the seven big diamonds from the seven islands. You do this by collecting seven small diamonds from enemies with rainbows from above them. So what? Gotta rely on luck? That is bullshit! Actually, that's not quite true. It may seem random, but the color of the diamond actually depends on where an enemy lands when defeated. So it comes down to precision rather than luck. In fact, if you get all of them in order, you'll unlock a secret door with a permanent power-up. So, once you get all seven big diamonds, three more islands appear. The first is based on the Fairyland story, a game from 1985, the second is based on the shmup series Darius, and the final world is based on Bubble Bobble itself. Love the attention to detail here! This time, the small diamonds give you mirrors, which you also need to get the true ending. As for the boss of Shadow, it's a giant bubble dragon. Oh, wait, no! Its true form is a giant Baron Von Blubba. And once you defeat him with the three mirrors, you restore everyone to normal and get a hero celebration. While Rainbow Islands is often overshadowed by its predecessor, it still holds up and is a worthy sequel. It's vibrant, with colorful graphics and great sound design, and its gameplay has a surprising amount of depth. 
However, I will say thank goodness for home versions and ports, because those allow you to understand the game without the constraints of your pockets. Next up is a bit of a special case. Parasol Stars, the story of Bubble Bobble 3. I call this a special case because this was actually never released in arcades. It was originally released on the terribly underrated TurboGrafx-16. There were rumors of arcade prototypes existing, but those were never confirmed. The game was released in 1991, published by Working Designs in America. Despite being a direct sequel to Rainbow Islands, it plays more like the original Bubble Bobble being a Clear All the Enemies platformer. This time, you use magic parasols. You can stun smaller enemies by touching them with your parasol, and then throw them into other enemies. And unlike Rainbow Islands, which dropped co-op for reasons I can only assume are related to the vertical nature of the game, co-op returns here. And of course, the levels are still vibrant with catchy music and colorful graphics. Not to mention, it's fun to toss things around, especially when you uncover hidden score items. In fact, by throwing them along the same lines on the screen, you uncover gradually more valuable items up to an extra continue. Big help there. Of greater importance in this game are the drops. They contain elemental powers that are unleashed when you gather five of them on top of your parasol. If you do this twice in the same level, a panel of that element will appear on the next one. Collecting three stuns all the enemies on screen. Collect three of the same element, and like in Rainbow Islands, you'll find a secret door after you beat the boss. Speaking of the bosses... How did Taito not get sued for any of this? Speaking of the secret door, the literal key to the true ending lies in World 8, which is a callback to Rainbow Islands. This time, you need three star panels, and after beating the big bubble dragon, you'll reach a Bubble Bobble themed world, complete with Grumple Gromit as the boss, followed by a bleak final world which vaguely resembles Chak and Pop. And here lies the final boss, Chaosticon. At first, it looks like a ghost in a black robe, but enough star tonics and it turns into... this thing. So you gotta deal with meteors, spawning enemies, and more in order to free the giant Chacken. Truth be told, Parasol Stars is a fun game, especially with a buddy, but the issue is that it's hard to find officially. The TurboGrafx-16 is a collector's item nowadays, and the only official re-release in America was on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, which was only sold on... Okay, two more games to go in this brief history, and these sequels are more akin to the original. Take it away, bub! Bubble Symphony, also known as Bubble Bobble 2, was released in 1994 on Taito's F3 system arcade board, and went back to the gameplay style of the original with a couple new elements. First and foremost are the four characters. Bub and Bob are joined by Kululun and Kororon, and each has a different trait. According to the story, they're the children of the original Bubby and Bobby. I will not inquire further. They ended up turned into bubble dragons by this Pope-looking hyper-drunk and trapped in the game's world, and there's only one real way out. Though there are plenty of ways to get there. One of the main draws of this game is that you have choices of worlds after the first level and after every boss. These worlds include callbacks to even more old title games like Kiki Kai Kai, you might know it as Pocky and Rocky, and even more obscure games like The New Zealand Story and Puli Rula. And dear lord do these backgrounds look great! The graphics and music of the series had improved drastically by that year. As far as gameplay goes, it goes back to the classic idea, and this might have been the most complicated means of reaching the true end out of the whole series. To even reach the final world, you need to collect the four colored keys. You do this by finding musical note panels hidden in the floor of each level. You have plenty of chances to do so, since there are 7 to 10 levels in each world. Only with all four keys can you access the final world and take down Hyperdrunk, who really lives up to his name. But that's still not enough. You also need to regain your human form by collecting the three Rod Bubbles, which only appear in certain levels when the Hurry Up appears. My advice? Find a guide. And then there's the Super Game, which again lets you reach the true, true ending. Because naturally, if you enjoy Bubble Bobble, you basically know what to expect from Bubble Symphony, which is a good time. You gotta put in the work for the true ending, but a great time is had in the process. Unfortunately, it's not easy to come by without emulating it. The only means of doing so in America and Europe is the PC version of Taito Legends 2. 
Still easier than the last game on our lineup. That last game would be Bubble Memories, The Story of Bubble Bobble 3, released in 1996. Aside from being chronologically confusing, this was the last Bubble Bobble game to be released in arcades, and only ever saw home release in a PS2 compilation in Japan, likely due to the game's relatively lackluster performance in arcades. And honestly, this game takes a couple steps back, particularly in presentation. So, not much changes plot-wise, except it supposedly takes place sometime between Rainbow Islands and Bubble Symphony. Bubby and Bobby have been changed into Bubble Dragons... again? Call it a running theme. And the monster responsible has broken the magic potion that can change them back, and locked itself in the Rainbow Tower. First off, what the hell happened with the backgrounds here? Bubble Symphony had beautiful pixel art backgrounds, and now we have stock images? It's like they just went random on Google Image Search and called it a day. Also, no more branching paths. Which makes sense, given that we're in a tower, but I like that idea of replayability. Gameplay hasn't really changed, with the only real addition in terms of gameplay being giant enemies, which can only be captured by blowing... giant bubbles. There is logic in what he says. The tower itself is 80 floors high, with the final 10 requiring that you collect the potion in each of the previous seven zones. Like the musical notes from the previous game, you need to step on a certain spot in the proper level to get the potion. If you manage to get all seven potions by the time you complete level 70, you get access to the final 10 floors where the final boss is revealed as Super Dark Great Dragon. Wait... This is the same creep from Rainbow Islands! And just when you think you've beaten him, he ditches his body, makes off with the potions, and flees to an ominous island in the distance. And while you were chasing him, he turned all the villagers into dragons. And to change everyone back... You have to play the super game! That is bullshit blazing! Dude, my heart is blazing! So with the super game, not only are the enemies and levels completely different, but the bosses now are defeated with different potions. For instance, instead of the Thunder Potion with which you fought the final boss before, now it's a Music Note Potion. Speaking of which... CURSE YOU, BARON! Yup, Super Game has one more phase against a mechanical Baron before you complete the potion and return everyone to normal. And that's Bubble Memories for ya. It's still good, but when you compare it to Bubble Symphony, you can see what Memories lacks. The music and sprite work are still on point, and the giant bubble mechanic works well enough, but returning to two identical characters, the shift to stock backgrounds, and the removal of all those different worlds ding my final opinion a bit. Still, I wish we'd get it in a collection or something, because at the end of the day, it's still a fun game. Thankfully, this and 39 other games are slated to be bundled on Taito's Egret 2 Mini Arcade console, which was recently announced to be getting a Western release. Good things come to those who wait, I guess. Now, while this was the last of the Bubble Bobble arcade games, the series itself continued on consoles and handhelds. Naturally, some were decent, while others... weren't. Most recently, Bubble Bobble 4 Friends brought us a four-player experience for modern generations. It was released on Switch initially in 2019, the PS4 version coming a year later with a new expansion, and earlier this year, it dropped on Steam and even included a level editor. Honestly, the fact that we've gotten a new game in this series with the same classic gameplay just shows how timeless the formula of the original Bubble Bobble is. It's a perfect example of co-op from the golden age of arcades, and it's destined to be remembered for years to come. It's even better if you have a significant other. So I've heard. Now there is a spin-off I didn't talk about, but I only have so much time in a video before it starts to drag. But on the plus side, I know a guy who loves that spin-off as much as I do. Don't worry, I tested repairs on the trans server after it got fixed. Thoroughly. I'm the Quarter Guy, and until next time, the arcade is closed. Alright, let's talk about your weapon. Your handle construction gives me a good grip, and I can easily tell where the edge is. Now, let's talk about your edge. It is razor sharp. Every thrust penetrates deep and lacerates on the way out, and every slash cuts easily into this wild boar carcass. Overall, sir, your weapon? It will kill! Next time, Top 10 Video Game Swords! It's game time! Hey everyone, QG here! If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around! Feel free to check out my Twitter and my Twitch streams, and consider supporting me through Patreon, and donating to my Extra Life campaign to support Children's Wisconsin. Thanks for watching.